Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Rudensky. I'm the Senior Director for Education here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to today's program, which is entitled Concealed Treasures, Objects Taking into Hiding During the Holocaust. Artifacts are one of the coins of the realm at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, as they are at most history museums. Although they are usually just silent objects, the stories behind artifacts especially artifacts connected to the Holocaust can be profound. Escaping from ghettos and work camps, evading roundups and manhunts, Jews temporarily reconstructed their homes on the run. The objects that Jewish men, women, and children took with them into hiding during the Holocaust shed light on their experiences in search of refuge. Jewish items retained in hiding had a practical role to play, helping to keep Jews warm and fed, but they were also sites of loving memory, longing, and anxiety. Uh, and I would also like to say that um, those objects that were kept also have an additional kind of meaning. Um, we look forward to exploring some of these artifacts today. Let me tell you about our speaker. Natalia Lexun is Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Graduate School of Turo College. She is a historian of Eastern European and Jewish history and the Holocaust. She's the author of Where To? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 to 1950, and the co-editor of the 20th and 29th volumes of the scholarly journal Pauline. Her critical edition of Gershon Taffet's Destruction of Zsolkiev Jews was published in, in 2019. Her most recent book is Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, published by the Littman Library in 2021. She is currently working on a book about the so-called cadaver affair at European universities in the 1920s and 1930s, and on a project dealing with daily lives of Jews hiding Galicia during the Holocaust. Uh, so before I go on, I just wanna ask everybody except for Natalia to mute their uh, microphones, please. Thank you. Um, our plan for today is as follows. Uh, Professor Alexun will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which time we will invite questions from, from the audience. Please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions, which will be read after the program. We hope to end around two o'clock, maybe a little after two. After the lecture today, we will send a, a link uh, and an evaluation form for uh, those who are teachers. So please plan to spend a few minutes completing it. Your feedback is important to us and to our Fund of the Claims Conference. I appreciate your taking this task seriously. Our next program, which is for teachers in Jewish schools will be on Sunday, February 13th. It is entitled Bitter Reckoning, Israel Tries Holocaust Survivors as Nazi Collaborators. Professor Dan Porat of the Hebrew University will examine how the young state of Israel dealt with uh, accused collaborators who made Aliyah along with other Holocaust survivors. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Claims Conference, uh, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany for funding today's program. And um, so before I hand the microphone over to, um, uh, to Professor Alex soon, I'm just gonna make ask everybody again to kindly mute. Uh, if you're not muted, I'm going to mute you, your, your microphone. Uh, so that we only hear, um, we are, are only hearing um, uh, Natalia. Okay, so, okay, good. Thank you so much for everybody muting. And let's see here. I'm gonna put you as the uh, speaker view. Okay. Well, I'm going to switch to PowerPoint anyhow, very. Okay, very, so, very so, without, so without further ado, I'm handing over, I'm going to hand over the microphone to um, Natalia, and Natalia, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to learn from you. It's always a pleasure to be to be here and uh, and to learn with you, uh, with you all. And some of you I, I recognize, and some of you I, I wish one day we will actually uh, stay over after lecture and have tea. Uh, let me now um, share the PowerPoints since uh, indeed objects are at the heart of what I would love to for us to discuss together. And um, now I'm giving you all the heads up. Um, um, 
And let me let me just say that this uh, this is a huge uh, subject and in indefinite number of stories that could be discussed in the context of material culture uh, in the Holocaust, material culture of Jewish objects, and in particular in the context of hiding. And I will be sharing with you almost all of the objects and stories connected to the objects come from my uh, research for the book on hiding in Eastern Galicia. But um, these are not uh, um, perspectives or insights that are unique, I think, to Eastern Galicia, um, now Western Ukraine. But really, we can also ask the, the, this question of regional um, or local particularity um, when, we, when we get to the uh, questions and discussion part. Um, let me start uh, with a testimony um, here in Polish for maybe some, some of you can, uh, can have a glimpse, uh, but it's a testimony uh, given in very early in 1945 uh, in Przemysl, um, what became uh, east, southeastern Poland, by a survivor, um, Zania Zania Rattenbach. I tried to find uh, as much information about her and her family background. I wasn't really able to find much, uh, but she gave this testimony and recalled uh, a summer day uh, in August 1942, uh, when uh, in her town of Dolina, today in West Western uh, Ukraine, um, the Shoah uh, happened, uh, the, the killing, uh, um, the mass killing took place. The town looked like a slaughterhouse during the action. There was no place where Jewish blood was not spilled. Crowds of Jews were immediately led to the Jewish cemetery. Once there, they had to, they had to strip naked and stand on a board over a previously prepared deep mass grave. Several victims were shot at simultaneously and as a result, only some fell in dead and others were only lightly or severely wounded. Dead and wounded were pushed into the grave and the mass of moaning people were covered with soil. After the action, Gestapo and Ukrainian militia sealed the abandoned Jewish apartments from which all things were taken to storage. Clothes that Jews were forced to take off before they were shot at the cemetery were also taken to a storage. So we have here the heart of this terrible account, not only the murder, but also things that are being taken and put together and later on actually auctioned locally. But over the course of this day and the following three days, uh, most of the Jewish population of Dolina, some 2000 Jews before the war, but with the refugees, probably at least a thousand more uh, were murdered in situ, while some, the young and the strong, were taken to a labor camp in Vyshkov near the border with Slovakia, where they, were, uh, uh, where they died due to malnutrition, hard labor and abuse. Only very few managed to escape from there and hid in the area. Uh, Rattenbach escaped at dawn together with her six-year-old daughter, Junia. Uh, they uh, spent three weeks in the forest, still in their nightgowns and barefoot. At some point, uh, they joined a group of other Jewish escapees, men, women, and children. All of them left in a frenzy and literally run out of their beds to the forest, but they were uh, hunted down. While all captured Jews were taken to the police station to be murdered, uh, Zhania managed to beg one member of the militia that she had recognized, he was a local man, to let her and her child go in exchange for objects she had left for safekeeping with familiar Ukrainians. Having left her child as a pawn, she returned to Dolina to recover some of her valuables. 
and she tells in her testimony, to my, to my misfortune, nobody wanted to give back these things. In the middle of the night, I went from one to another, telling what brought me to them at this hour. This, however, did not make them instead, that does not move them. Instead, they were furious that I dare to demand the return of the goods and that I'm even alive. At some point, however, she managed to beg the return of one rug, um, something that was called in the area Kilim, and this is not the actual rug, but it's the style that would be made in the area, um, with which she, she returned to the forest to offer it in exchange for the life of her child. However, she was disoriented in the forest, and when she heard uh, a sound of, of shooting, she interpreted that sound as a proof that the policeman lost his uh, patience waiting and simply murdered her daughter. Uh, what turned out later uh, was that the man actually shot in the air to let her know where he was and left the child unharmed. The daughter was then picked up by a group of Jews that were escaping from one forest to another and murdered with the rest of this group the following day. Uh, the mother, um, despaired, uh, returned uh, to her familiar surrounding, hid in a village under hay for six days, and eventually survived near the forest of Dolina, while her daughter, uh, she found out later the circumstances, and her husband perished. Here we see uh, what I call a ransom object, a case of a rug that was to buy, quite literally, by the life of a six-year-old Jewish girl and could have played, if brought in time, could have played this crucial, essential role in the struggle uh, for survival that her mother um, uh, waged. Uh, Rattenbachs, who owned a sawmill and was a middle, were a middle-class, well-to-do family, indeed left quite a number of things uh, with their trusting uh, trusted uh, neighbors and found out um, that um, that trust was actually uh, betrayed. Other Jews who weighed, went into hiding left as well their possessions with friends, with neighbors. Some of them were actually invited to do so by people who encouraged them to bring their things over to uh, their um, houses. From there, these objects could be used to sell uh, and buy food, uh, to pay for the hiding place if they were hiding somewhere else, or to bribe those who capture Jews, as in the case of Rattenbach. But th these could also be objects that people carried with them or literally on them, watches, rings, earrings, shoes, coats, sweaters come up very often in testimonies and, and oral interviews that people literally take off their sweater in exchange for not being handed over or not being killed. But survival objects were also taking, taken into hiding places. And what people took was a function of pragmatic concerns, of course, these were the essential um, items, food, clothing, blankets, cooking tools, utensils, uh, but they also depended on a myriad of social factors. What was the social standing of the family of an indivi or individual to begin with? Um, what could they have taken with themselves? And even more importantly, more importantly, the timing uh, and the circumstances of the escape, as we saw in the case of Rattenbach, she didn't even have time to put on shoes or to take a coat with herself. She ran out of bed as she was. Um, the later people uh, were escaping, the later they were even able to organize that escape or transferring themselves into hiding, the less items they were able 
uh, to take. And then of course, there are items that people take with themselves that are supposed to confirm their non-Jewish identity. They are important not because they feed them or because they keep them warm, but because they are supposed to perform to those who find them or live with them or work with them that here are not Jews, but Christians. Uh, in the area that I study in Western Ukraine, this would be either at the Poles, Catholic Poles, or, uh, or Ukrainians, um, most often Greek Orthodox, uh, less so Russian Orthodox. And so there is this division, just like in two strategies of hiding survival through hiding that uh, we see at the end of the war and survivors, survivors talk about it in Lvov, in the Jewish committee, they called themselves either Maranos, uh, those that passed as Christians uh, or rats because they were um, pale, because they were hiding, they were physically underground or behind walls or inside uh, furniture. Uh, they were not um, getting any sunlight. So these are slightly different kinds of objects that people need for these two um, survivals. Here just just a glimpse of contemporary map and the area that I'm studying is in particular uh, this part uh, which, which is um, Western Ukraine today and was part of uh, Polish Republic uh, between the two world wars. I mentioned the importance of timing and here just one of many example, uh, examples I could uh, bring with to you uh, 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 Lipa um, Stricker, who was a member of a large and well-to-do family. Uh, they uh, owned an estate, uh, a fascinating phenomenon, quite characteristic to Eastern Galicia, uh, in which Jews were not just working on soil, but actually owned estates. And here they also have a brewery. They are clearly here raising Lechaim. And, um, and this is a family that to some extent um, lives and uh, lives an almost normal life until the spring of 1942, where this estate uh, Wojciechowice in the Przemyślane County uh, is um, visited by uh, one particularly cruel uh, um, Nazi um, murderer by the name of Grzymek. He had a trial after the war and, and Lipa um, was able to testify in the trial against him. That's how we have his testimony. And he, within uh, 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 a couple of weeks um, murders um, half of the family and uh, throws them out of their uh, home and leaves them literally with nothing. So the family goes from relatively comfortable life um, to uh, being um, escapees and, and paupers uh, in, in hiding. And Lipa mentions how his wife had to steal um, carrots and onions um, because they, they were simply left with uh, nothing. Uh, here is another uh, such case and also I'm alluding here to those not practical objects, um, not purely pragmatic existential objects that pe people take with themselves. Uh, uh, this is uh, coming from uh, Gina Mar's um, memoir left in Yad Vashem archive and the picture is not of um, Gina but of her only daughter um, Lucia, who uh, was murdered uh, as a teenager in the Holocaust while her parents survived. So among most valuable items that Gina um, saved uh, through her time in hiding was a, a picture of her daughter uh, from her school ID. But this is another family that is rather well-to-do and comfortable and goes first through the process of 
impoverishment under the Soviet occupation. This is the area that in the fall of 1939 comes under the Soviet occupation until the summer of 1941. And then they really lose um, everything very quickly um, with the arrival of the Germans. And so when they go into hiding, uh, the home with the crystals and porcelain and glasses and kilims and rugs and furniture that she recalls in her a memoir no longer exists. She's not really in a position even to think of what to take with herself when she and her husband decide to, uh, to hide. Uh, and again, we have here, just like this rug in a testimony of um, Janja Rattenbach, uh, one mother who loses her only child, and in a memoir of uh, Gina Mar, another mother who loses uh, her only daughter. Um, this kilim, this rug, and this picture are also kind of phantom objects. Uh, they represent the loss, uh, the loss of, of the children, and really the loss of the entire family life that, uh, that these uh, uh, women had. But the pragmatic objects uh, that people try whenever they can organize their escape, whenever they, there's still time and resources, um, they don't often go into exact um, um, lists of what they take. I think in the testimony, I, th I think because they consider it a given, but when they do, uh, what is repeated is buckwheat, uh, beans, uh, potatoes, uh, clothes, uh, bed sheets, blankets, pots, matches, ovens, sometimes even ovens with a chimney so that people can actually cook in their hiding places, but also uh, tools that are necessary for making such hiding places. Uh, shovels and, and axes. Now, of course, it depends on whether you are in the rural setting or you are going into a hiding, into hiding in a um, fake, behind a fake wall, uh, then you don't need an ax and you don't need a shovel. Uh, but um, in Eastern Galicia, a lot of these hiding stories are happening uh, in a forest uh, or in a case, as in the case of Esther uh, Stermer, a really exceptional story in a sense that this is a three generations that survive uh, together, um, the matriarch sitting in the middle of this picture, her children and grandchildren, uh, by hiding in two sets of um, caves, uh, or grotta as she, as she calls them. Um, and I highly recommend to you her um, translated into English uh, Yiddish uh, memoir, We Fight to Survive and no place on earth uh, documentary <clears throat> about the finding of the um, our archaeological digs, as it were, in their hiding places. But uh, in the case of Esther Stermer, um, these uh, physical objects of making uh, the hiding places possible are uh, absolutely essential. Um, just a peek at the setting, uh, this is a family that lives in a small town near Borschtuf. Borschtuf is a slightly bigger uh, town. Um, and just to give you a snippet of when they go into the first um, hiding place, into the first cave, uh, one of the sons brings um, logs and boards and makes some kind of beds inside. Um, another family that hides together with Stermer uh, sets up a um, um, dental practice of sorts uh, in that uh, cave so that they can provide services that then would be paid with food that, uh, of course, is essential to keep them uh, going. Uh, there is a little stove, as you can see in the third piece uh, that I paste uh, here. 
And uh, a very important for all those hiding places is access to water. They have first issues with access to water in the first cave. It gets easier in a second. But she describes all kinds of uh, objects that make um, life in the cave uh, possible for them. And it's clear that this is uh, an escape that is well prepared. They, they amass things, they take things with them, they don't run in the middle of the night uh, during, the, during the roundup. Another somewhat prepared escape is described in a, a memoir of diary and memoir of Moshe Maltz. Uh, this is um, a memoir from uh, from Sokal, where again, in the end, two Jewish families are hiding in the attic, so they don't need to dig a bunker, they don't need to make uh, bunk beds, uh, but they prepare in terms of uh, taking um, uh, clothes and, and, and at least some of the um, food uh, with them. Of course, when Jews in Eastern Galicia, for the most part, escape and go into hiding, which is in the summer of, from the summer of 42 through the fall of 42 until the spring of 43, that really, when really almost all ghettos are liquidated, um, they don't know for how long they will need to hide. And as much as they amass beans and buckwheat, it's never enough. And all these people find themselves in a situation of needing to find uh, access to food through selling other objects. And these are those um, 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 objects that are objects to barter with. But I mentioned also clothes, and clothes are extremely important in many testimonies. Uh, uh, people uh, detail how clothes in a damp conditions in hiding places simply um, come apart. Uh, and if they don't have anything to change them for, and usually they would sell their clothes for food, they, they sell everything they have on themselves. So some uh, actually remained with, uh, with um, undergarments like this, uh, that also in a way, um, I, I would argue that for someone like Sarah um, uh, Krebholz, um, this was uh, also a memory of the life she had before, because here she's almost naked, but she, the last piece she's wearing is, uh, was a rather fancy, uh, uh, a rather fancy slip uh, um, that was part of her um, middle class life. Uh, before she became a um, hunted animal uh, trying, to, uh, trying to escape uh, capture uh, and trying to rescue her daughter as well. And I think that that's why these objects, I'm curious what Paul, for example, what you think about it, but they are not just physical uh, objects taken from hiding places, but they really represent the emotion, emotional burden of, of hiding, the, the conditions in which people hide, but also the emotions by connecting them with the life before. And just like the slip um, maybe was a memory of the life before the Nazi occupation. Uh, for uh, Christina Higer, this green sweater was also a memory of a grandmother she, who ne needed that for her. And she was, by the time that uh, Higgers went into um, sewage where, where they survived of, uh, of Lvov, uh, she was already murdered. So this is also a kind of a material connection to the loss uh, of, the, of the loved ones, uh, to the loss of the status, to the loss of the safety that people had uh, before. Now, of course, uh, aside from buckwheat and beans and, and matches and stoves, there is a question of the Jewish objects, right, of the ritual objects uh, that people take with them. And there are even accounts in the testimonies that suggest that these um, unpractical objects um, in some groups arise 
mixed feeling, ambivalence. There is, for example, a testimony I saw from a group in the forest where one man would insist on schlepping phylum uh, in, uh, in a bag with him and other men mocked him uh, because they thought that given the impossible conditions that they were living in, this was a, sort of a pointless effort that he would have, he should have rather put this physical strength into, into carrying uh, something um, that could be eaten or that could be sold for food or bartered for food with peasants. Um, so here, this is not from Eastern Galicia, but just because I didn't have an object that was of that kind that um, to show you a, an image of. Um, but Esther Sturmer, for example, discusses in her memoir how her group, which was a large group of Jews, especially in the first cave, uh, they had one prayer book for high holidays, which was used com communally by all. And she was also writing there as she was figuring calendar and, and, and Shabbatot and, 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 and holidays. Uh, so this was kind of a, a Jewish calendar slash chronicle slash prayer book for all. Same happened for Moshe Maltz. They also had one uh, uh, prayer book for high holidays with them. Um, uh, here uh, is a prayer book of um, Michael Melman from Zhukiev, Zhokva near Lvov. And that group is actually um, unique because um, this was 18 Jews hiding together several families and they had a Torah scroll with them which was um, uh, paid for by one, this, these were well-to-do uh, merchant families uh, in Zhukiev and, uh, and they took this Torah scroll with them. Uh, at some point in hiding when the house, when there was a danger of fire, um, near the house where they were all hiding, which would obviously be a disaster and give them all away, uh, the fire stopped and, and the Jews uh, in, hidden in that particular place were convinced that this was the presence of the Torah, that uh, the, the Torah scroll that protected them. Uh, so, uh, you know, what is practical and what is not practical here, it's not a simple um, division uh, that the buckwheat is, buckwheat is essential and, um, and the prayer book is somewhat of a... Um, addition for some people this was as essential as um, as food uh, as food items um, and now i mentioned the uh, maranos uh, the so-called maranos as they were called uh, by observers uh, after the war and by among themselves um, what do you do when you run uh, from a ghetto as here in a case of Maria Rosenblum uh, from Koamea, and you're not hiding in a forest, you're not building a bunker, you're not going into an attic, but rather you're hiding from a ghetto to uh, perform a completely different identity. And in this case, everything you carry with you, everything you wear, of course, also how you speak and how you behave, your body language, but objects as such play an important role. And so uh, in the case of Maria Rosenblum, it starts with a fur coat, uh, that particular fur coat that she gets when she leaves the ghetto on Christmas night. And it's not only because it's cold, but she is to pretend that she's Christian and not a Hasidic girl that she was. And, and this was part of her uh, identity. This was important that she looked the part. And here is Maria Rosenblum from, uh, from the uh, oral interview years later, of course. And a story that I find particularly convincing in this, um, in this unique role that objects taken with people uh, play um, is uh, the story of Donia uh, Pickholtz, um, married name Ostrover, who uh, also uh, raised in an Orthodox uh, uh, family in, in Stray and later on on an estate, well-to-do family. She ends up in Bolechów working as a 
This is Bolehu of um, Daniel Mendelssohn's uh, um, uh, Lost, um, working in a beer house, uh, serving beer to Ukrainian and, and, and Germans, uh, to um, gendarmes and militiamen. And she, uh, she transforms herself into a Frozina Skobelek, uh, a Ukrainian girl. Now, this what, how this trans transformation and performance is possible. Yes, of course, the papers, she, she gets false papers from a Ukrainian uh, priest who was uh, protected during the Soviet occupation by Jews and he felt grateful. And as a gratitude gesture, uh, he uh, provided uh, Donya with uh, papers of a Ukrainian girl who died in an accident. Uh, but Part of her persona was also um, embroidered blouse that was kind of an ethnic clothing item that made her believable as an illiterate Ukrainian girl. She also had a Ukrainian nanny growing up, and so she spoke um, fluent Ukrainian. Uh, so that language and behavior and the familiarity, but also the clothing. She had a handkerchief, she had the blouse, um, um, and, and that's how she played that role uh, so convincingly that then as a Ukrainian girl, she ends up hiding two Jews, um, a, a husband and a wife, who believe that they met a, an angel, a Ukrainian peasant girl who took pity on them and hid them for a year in a pig tree. Meanwhile, they were hidden by a Jewish girl and they never guessed it until, uh, until the occupation uh, was over. Now, religious objects are particularly important. And here, obviously, we're not talking about uh, at film or prayer, uh, high holiday prayer books or Torah scroll, uh, but uh, Christian objects uh, that is so important for people who are passing as non-Jews to have on them and to, 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 to use them in a way that, again, um, proves them to be who they claim to be. So we have um, in many Holocaust museums, there are pictures of Jewish children who are receiving the First Communion dressed appropriately, but also these holy cards, part of Catholic culture uh, received by a Jewish girl who passes uh, as, a, as a Christian uh, Polish girl and carries it with, it, uh, with her. That means, of course, wearing a cross, uh, that, uh, that means, uh, of course, wearing um, a medallion with, uh, with Mary. And then there is, of course, and it comes up in testimonies a lot, there is a very subtle game of how much you need to play with these objects and how much is too much and would make you seem too eager uh, when the cross is too big and might actually make you look suspicious. And then there are objects that I'm not quite sure how to categorize, but they are sort of a, a, a bridge crossing between uh, identities taken on during the war and the identities re, um, regained, reclaimed after the war. And the same uh, girl received this teddy bear uh, from, um, from her mother because uh, it was traumatic for her to find out that she was in fact not the Catholic girl with, with Holly, uh, uh, Lady of um, Our Lady of Częstochowa, the Queen of Poland, but that she was in fact a completely different person with a completely different name. And so the steady bear was, was a toy that was sort of, was supposed to soothe that uh, that transition uh, or return to the identity uh, that Selma didn't quite remember. And then objects that are very rare, I think, not only very rare in um, museums, but I think very rare to actually find. Uh, these are those, I call them future-oriented objects. Uh, they're not necessarily ritual Jewish objects that would identify you immediately. So you would not carry them if you were um, passing as a non-Jew, uh, but objects that 
are future oriented because they identify you, but they also provide credentials to your uh, professional persona from before the war. And here is the, the diploma of a teacher of um, Jewish uh, high schools uh, that was um, issued for Shimon Kahane uh, before the war, and he was hiding with it, uh, which I think means, uh, maybe I'm reading into it, but it means that he hoped um, that this would have a meaning when the war is over. Uh, he was going to show this diploma and, and return to the life that he had uh, before. And again, there, this is yet another object that is practical if you survive the war, but also an object that, that connects you between the life you're having on the run with constant uh, th uh, threat and fear um, and, and humiliation connected with this, uh, with the life you had before. And so some diaries and notebooks, not many, I've seen just a handful, but some of them actually are continuation of, of notes and diaries that people started writing before the war. This is Shimon Kahane starting to write his diary when his daughter was born. Um, and, uh, and he continues through the war. So he hides nearby his daughter. His daughter is hiding as a Christian child living outside. He's hiding, hiding. He's in the attic and he looks at her and he notes how her development continues as much as he can see from a distance, just like he was noting various milestones in her life before the war when he was able to to, to be her father uh, openly and publicly. And I want to end, oh yes, I, I need to end. I want to end with a unique uh, text, which is not an object, but it, it is about objects. And in a way it becomes an object itself. Uh, it's a very um, famous um, um, poem uh, written, um, by this uh, Jewish poetess, uh, Zuzanna Gitschanka, which was a pen name of Sarah Ginsburg. As you can see, she dies in 1945, but this is not a happy end story. She was uh, captured and murdered literally weeks before uh, Krakow was liberated when she was uh, in hiding there. But this is a um, poem from her first brush with death when she's betrayed uh, in Lemberg in Lvov by a concierge woman uh, and the story that that the, that she describes here is a story of objects if you read it and killings the, those rags are mentioned um, as well um, here uh, it's a it's a it's a sarcastic ironic painful account of of, of looting of all those goods that will be taken over uh, because she was captured. In this particular case, uh, her friends were actually able to um, bribe uh, the, the gendarmerie and she was released that time, but, um, but not, not uh, during the next betrayal. Uh, however, this particular song, this particular poem is also unique, not only I think because it's of exceptional beauty um, and, and not only because it has objects at the heart of it, but also because after the war, this song, this poem was used in court when um, the, the said um, uh, concierge woman, uh, Hominova was actually uh, indicted and tried uh, for collaboration with the Germans uh, based on this song, on this poem. This poem was treated as a proof of her uh, betrayal and her uh, collaboration. Um, so let me stop here and I'm looking forward to uh, questions and comments and suggestions and your own insights into objects. Thank you so much. Natalia, thank you. That was really a fascinating presentation. Um, 
uh, and really, uh, really moving artifacts and the stories behind the artifacts are, you know, extraordinary. Um, I'd like to invite people, if they'd like to submit questions, to submit them in the chat, um, if possible. So if you could, uh, you know, send me your questions and I will read them to uh, Natalia. I just wanted, while people are doing that, I just maybe wanted to say a couple of, just a couple of reflections, really. One was that that one of the earlier artifacts you showed was that postcard from Lu Chimar. Um, so I thought it was just really, you know, it captured a certain moment because it had a German stamp, but the postmark was was a Soviet postmark. So it was that 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 kind of time when they were, you know, quasi allied. Um, so really interesting. And um, thank you also for talking about the St the Sturmer family. You know that incredible. I'll just reiterate for the people who are on the on the Zoom meeting that this was a family that hid in caves, as as Natalia said. So really extraordinary. Let me ask you, since you since, since you mentioned them, was there a whole network of of Ukrainians and and others who helped them? How did they? They must have had somebody who helped them on the outside. Um, not really. Uh, I mean, they their help. Their, their initial help was um, um, an acquaintance, a forester, who helped them uh, pick the the, the best uh, place. Uh, they thought they uh, now they escape, and this is why they are relatively uh, better off in terms of organizing it. They're not escaping during a liquidation, but rather the Jews of Korolovka, Korolivka now, uh, are ordered to move to the ghetto in Borshchev. And while most people do, um, Stermer, uh, it's, I mean, she's really the, the, the force behind it. She decides that uh, they are not going to do it and her grown up children and her sons and her sons-in-law are helping to prepare uh, the whole move. Um, now they have this forester that, uh, that uh, assists them. The family were actually grain merchants before the war. So they have contacts, um, but uh, fascinating for me is, and that's why I'm saying, please uh, read it uh, because it's uh, it's not well a well known diary, and it's one of those amazing texts. Also because it comes from a middle aged woman. You know, we 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 don't have many voices of of people her age um, at the time of of the of a grandmother. Um, uh, they are very independent and. Um, and they use all kinds of um, uh, strategies. For example, she uses um, a, a Jewish calendar to figure out which nights would be the longest nights. And so these are the nights that they go outside to scavenger for food. Uh, they are very uh, well, um, um, uh, uh, they're very familiar with with uh, rural life, so they know that if they go on Sundays, the the, the fields will be will be empty because the peasants are in church, uh, or uh, you know. So they 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 really are exceptional in in that uh, sense. Um, and uh, no, there isn't really a network. And yes, there are stories in which people are passed from one um, um, helpful Bye. person to another, whether for money or not. I'm not now going into motivation of people who uh, assist uh, uh, hiding, uh, but uh, and this is part of the newer, um, uh, newer interest of Holocaust scholars. Uh, more and more we are no, we are finding out and we're examining the the self rescue of of Jews and Esther Stermer is really a case of of self rescue. Yeah, th thank you so much. That's a fascinating, uh, you know, a, a fascinating case, and I, I hope to get the book and, and read it. Um, we do have a question here. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation, and also uh, the question is if you could repeat the uh, memoir uh, names and authors. Sure. Um, so, um, um, 
See, I should know this all easily by heart, but let me just go through the uh, um, those that I mentioned. So Gina Mar, uh, unfortunately, is not uh, is not published, uh, but uh, um, and it's in Polish. Uh, only, but it's in Yad Vashem archives. If if you're interested, I'm happy to to share. Um, Esther Sturmer is We Fight to Survive, and again, I would encourage you to see the documentary. But if you see the documentary, read the diary as well or the memoir as well, because the documentary um, the documentary is really from. Uh, it's really a story of discovering this fascinating case, uh, but in the memoir, you have the voice of the actual um, matriarch. Um, then uh, the Maltzes, uh, it's years of horror. Uh, another little known uh, uh, diary slash memoir uh, written originally in Yiddish. Um, and what else did I... Mention oh I also would highly recommend um, uh, from uh, Zhukiev uh, the uh, diary of um, Clara Kramer uh, who was a um, teenage girl uh, whose parents were one of the families essential in organizing the hiding place and she wrote a fascinating she passed away unfortunately Clara not not long ago uh, a, a, an exceptional woman I'm, uh, I'm I was so uh, I'm so happy that I was able to speak with her briefly uh, on the phone um uh, so Clara Kramer is translated into English, uh, and and I would very very uh, much encourage you to to look into her um, her account. Uh, that's I think about it because there were objects uh, that are attached to stories, but these are the stories that are not uh, long uh, accounts um, available uh, for us to read in a published form. And a th no, thank you very much for that. Where can we find um, uh, uh, Sarah Ginsburg's or Susanna G G Ginchanka's? Ginchanka. Yeah, where can we find that poem? Um, well, first of all, I'm happy, uh, um, um, Paul, if you agree to be the, the um, uh, the transmission um, um, uh, tool. Uh, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint uh, with Paul and um, the English translation is available online. If you Google uh, non, non omnis moriar here, obviously Ginjanka is um, um, saluting um, um, uh, uh, harasses, but also a Polish uh, uh, poet uh, Słowacki. I mean, there is a whole literary tradition that goes into this uh, poem. But if you Google Ginchanka non omnis moriar, you, you'll see the translation available. There are better ones than there are fantastic ones and less fantastic ones. But uh, yes, uh, I, I, again, spend, a, spend an afternoon with, with a cup of tea with this poem because I just, um, I, I just had it on the screen for, for a moment. Yeah, no, it's a very, very, very moving poem, and you know, thank, thank you very much uh, for all of that. And then finally, I just wanted to ask uh, about uh, Donia Pickholz Ostrovers. Um, did she write memoirs, or how do we? No, no, unfortunately not. Not that I know of. I I know of her story from other Balechov survivors, uh, for whom she kind of became, uh, you know, this exceptional uh, case um, and her husband donated um, a, co a collection of photographs to USHMM. They're all scanned. So again, if you Google uh, Donia Pickholz, um, uh, you, you can look at, at the pictures but the blouse, for some reason, is no longer visible. I was, uh, I, I snapped that blouse uh, when it was still um, Googleable. Um, but but um, people talk about the fact uh, those those survivors from Bolechov uh, today talk about how unbelievably um, convincing 
she was in that role. And um, you might have not, because I was speaking fast, I, I didn't want to go over time, but there are several things going on here. A, that she's uh, passing for a year and a half as a Ukrainian um, uh, and um, um, pious Ukrainian. She goes to church every Sunday uh, and she passes as a, as a illiterate. Now, this is a girl who had private tutors who came from very uh, prestigious family. So she had to kind of remake herself on, on several levels, on a religious level, on a ling linguistic level, on a class level, and, and, and all of this in the context of drunk uh, uh, um, uh, men. Uh, hitting on her without a doubt. Um, so, and while doing this, she's uh, she's uh, uh, saving two Jews in a pig tree. Um, so, um, this is a remarkable story. And and uh, she passed away not long ago. I a few years ago when I was in Israel, I I, I was thinking about trying to get in touch with her and and interview her, but I was told that she was not in 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 the best shape for this. Um, but but I, I, want, I want her to be remembered um, and known um, among us educators. Well, thank you so much. I think also this, this, this topic you raise of self-rescue is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a great topic and, and one that uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a chance to explore further. Yes, yes, and, and, and again, um, there is, I, the more I'm, I'm working on it, the more I'm, I'm really fascinated by how much, um, um, how much wisdom and, and cunning um, and, and, and understanding of psychology uh, goes into these stories. And one uh, text that I didn't mention, Abraham Wilf, um, Megillat Damim, uh, it's it's a, originally written in uh, either Hebrew or Yiddish, but translated uh, into English. It's uh, about um, Skole. This is a man with, uh, ag again, a successful merchant with two teenage children who um, um, go, who is helped by a Ukrainian family uh, in exchange for um, promise of future um, financial uh, reward, uh, he, uh, his two children and two children of his brother who simply cannot see himself go through it and he passes his children to his brother to try to save them. Um, and uh, Avraham Wilf not only organizes this whole um, bunker, but he also keeps a record of passing objects to the Ukrainian, a very poor Ukrainian family. And he, he is playing this game in which he can't give them too much because if he gives them too much, they will have no uh, interest in taking the risk any further. So he takes a note, you know, on this date, I passed uh, two um, men's uh, shirts and one blouse. And then this day I passed one pair of pants and two pairs of socks. And it's literally this kind of uh, account of buying day by day and week by week um, through, these, uh, through these objects. Oh, thank you so much. It's a fascinating topic and, and um, I hope that we can return to it and explore, explore more. So, I, so uh, Natalia, I want to take a moment to thank you for joining us this, you know, this afternoon or in your case this evening. Um, and I want to thank, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, our pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, everybody else for joining us uh, on the Zoom call. Uh, our next program is going to be February 13th uh, about, um, uh, uh, I think it's called Bitter Reckoning. With, that's going to be with the Professor Dan Porat. And I want to wish everybody a good afternoon. So. Thank you. Be Bye -bye, well everybody. and safe.